Um, hi, so thank you for joining us today. We welcome each of you. So Sabina and I look forward to opening this seminar series with an introduction to the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, or widely known as the Global MPI. This is one of our core work at OFI. We also look forward to sharing few insights from the work done in the past years. Um, so I will cover the first two aspects of this talk. That is explaining to you what is the global MPI, followed by a couple of highlights from our 2020 cross-sectional work. Then Sabina will focus on the last two aspects of this talk. Now 2020 was a bit extra special for us because our research team members at OFI uh, extended the cross-sectional work to understand to what extent multidimensional poverty has changed over time and whether we are on track to meet the 2030 development agenda of not leaving anyone behind. So what is the Global MPI? The Global MPI is a quantitative assessment of the state of multidimensional poverty in the developing regions of the world. The measure is implemented using internationally comparable multi-topic household surveys for well over 100 countries. And these countries are home to 90% of the population living in the developing regions. Many governments around the world quite popularly tend to measure their official poverty measure using a monetary approach. I emphasize that a multi-dimensional measure matters because it complements any monetary measure of poverty and this includes the $1.9 a day poverty line by the World Bank. And why does this matter? It matters because a multi-dimensional measure captures poverty in multiple dimensions. That is, it goes beyond a single dimension. The Global MPI was first published in 2010. And if you remember, this was during the time of the Millennium Development Goals. The measure was developed by team members in OFI in collaboration with the UNDP's Human Development Office. The 2010 work is extensively documented by in two key publications by Sabina Alkaya and Maria Emma Santos. And if you are interested to refer to these two key publications, then please do visit our website where you can download these papers. Since then, we have been updating the Global MPI annually to include new data sets. In 2018, the update marked an important milestone. Uh, OFI and UNDP jointly undertook the first notable revision of the Global MPI. The aim was to closely align the measure where possible to the 2030 development agenda. So 2018, in essence, marked the global MPI's extension from its relationship with the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. In terms of method, the global MPI is a leading practical uh, application of the multi-dimensional poverty methodology that is pioneered by Sabina and James Foster. Their 2011 seminal paper outlined the Elkaya Foster method or the AF method. The AF method goes beyond the common way of measuring poverty, which is to simply calculate the percentage of the population who is poor, or also known as the incidence of poverty. Besides the incidence of poverty, the AF method allow us to identify the intensity of deprivation that is experienced by the poor. That is, we can actually calculate the percentage of deprivations suffered by the poor on average. A multi-dimensional index of poverty or MPI is calculated by multiplying the incidence by the intensity. At this stage, now you'll surely wonder, what are these deprivations? What is a deprivation profile? What is an average deprivation? And to explain this, allow me to introduce you MPI structure. The global MPI um, directly measures 
the deprivation that people face at the same time in different aspects of their life. And here we emphasize these different aspects of the life uh, through three key dimensions, which is the health, education and living standards. These dimensions are same as those used in the UNDP's Human Development Index. The MPI has two indicators for health, that is nutrition and child mortality. It has two indicators under the education dimension, which is years of schooling and school attendance. Finally, it has six indicators that make up the living standards dimension. These include cooking fuel, sanitation, drinking water, electricity, housing, and assets. The global MP MPI has a nested weight structure. So the indicators within each dimension is equally weighted. This means the indicators of health dimension and education dimension receive more weight than the indicators of the living standard dimension. Now, we are familiar with this 10 indicators. The next question that we need to ask is, how do we identify whether people are deprived or not in each of this indicator? And for that, we need to establish uh, a deprivation cutoff for each of the indicator. And then this would allow us to uniquely build a deprivation profile for each person in the surveys that are covered by the global MPI. Now, in terms of the nutrition indicator, we make use of all nutrition information that is available uh, for any household members. Uh, for any household members, we identify individuals as deprived if they live in a household that has a child under five who is stunted or underweight, or a young adult between the age of 15 to 19 years living in that household has low BMI that is adjusted for age and gender, or an adult between the age of 20 and up to 70 years in that household has low BMI. So if any of these individuals, the child, the young adult, or the um, adult between 20 to 70 years are malnourished, then we would identify that this household is deprived in nutrition. Next, we identify individuals as deprived in child mortality if they live in a household where a child under 18 has sadly died in the last five years preceding the survey year. Individuals are deprived in years of schooling if any eligible members who should have completed six years of schooling has not completed that cutoff. In other words, if there is at least one member with six years or more schooling, then everyone in the household will be identified as non-deprived. Individuals are deprived in school attendance if any school age child is not attending school up to the age at which he or she would complete class eight. For example, if the household has three children of school age and two of them are in school, while one is out of school, then we would consider every member in the household as deprived in school attendance. It should be noted that for indicators related to health and education, each household member may be identified as deprived or not deprived according to the information provided by other household members. This is partly because certain data such as anthropometric data was collected only from selected members of the household. In such case, we assume the negative effects of not achieving certain outcomes are shared within the household. Across the living standards, we identify individuals as deprived if their household uses solid fuel for cooking, uses unimproved or shared sanitation facility, uh, consumes drinking water from, a, uh, from any unsafe source, or if the source is at least a 30-minute round-trip walk, or if the household has no electricity connection, or if the household has inadequate um, housing materials, where probably the house a floor is made of dirt, or the roof or walls of the house is built using rudimentary materials, such as uh, plastic or loose stones. And finally, 
in terms of the asset the household is considered deprived if they do not own more than one of the eight small assets that are counted within the global mpi and this includes radio tv telephone uh, computer animal car bicycle motorbike and fridge now once we have established this cutoff and we have identified who is deprived then we are able to compute the deprivation score and once we have the deprivation then we will need to ask the next question which is who is poor so we have this 10 set of indicators we know who is deprived by each of these indicators we sum up the deprivation score and then we say within the global mpi a person is mpi poor if the person's deprivation score is equal to 33.3 percent or higher in other words if they are deprived in one third or more of these 10 weighted indicators. So let me give you a sense of reality to an individual's deprivation profile. Please let me introduce you to Tamang, a 56 year old landless woman from an indigenous minority caste in Nepal. Tamang is not her real name, but the person you're seeing in the picture on your screen is real as well as her multiple hardships that she experienced on a day-to-day -day basis is very real. Among lives with her husband who is living with significant disabilities and a low body mass index. Hence, the household is identified as deprived in nutrition. Among also lives with two granddaughters and both attending school. The older girl has just started her seventh grade. Hence, the family is not deprived in any of the education-related indicators. Tamang collects wood from the nearby jungle. She then carries the load on her back and walks to a nearby market to sell the wood. Any little income that she earns from selling the woods on that day would mean she can actually buy some rice and vegetables for her family for their day meal. The same wood that Tamang uses, um, that Tamang collects, is also used to cook her food at home. As such, the family is deprived in cooking fuel since they are using solid or unclean fuel. The family is deprived in housing because they live in a rudimentary hut with a dirt floor and the walls of the house are also built using rudimentary materials as you can see in the picture. The household has no toilet and they tend to use their neighbor's unprotected well for drinking water. So they are deprived in sanitation and drinking water. The house, they have electricity but they are also deprived in assets because they do not own more than one of the small assets considered by the global MPI. So is the Hmong and her family MPI poor? So we know that Tamang is deprived in six of the 10 indicators as indicated by the colored boxes of the chart. She's deprived in nutrition, which has one sixth of the indicator weight. She's also deprived in five of the six indicators in the living standard dimension, where each receives one eighteenth of the indicator weight. We then sum one sixth and five eighteenth of the weighted deprivation experienced by Tamang. Her deprivation score sums to 44.4%. In other words, Tamang is MPI poor because the deprivation score is above the poverty cutoff. Let me quickly summarize or, um, the four key steps of uh, what is the global MPI and uh, how we compute this measure. So we first have identified the 10 indicators that relate to the global MPI. And in the second step, we built a deprivation profile for each individual in our sample survey, just as we did for Tamang. Once we have computed the deprivation score, we move to the third step, which is to identify who is poor. And we know that in the global MPI, a person is identified as MPI poor if their deprivation score is equal to or higher than 33.3%. In the final step, the global MPI combines two pieces of information to measure acute multidimensional poverty, incidence 
and intensity. This follows the Alkaya Foster method. Let me bring your focus to the 2020 Global MPI work. This year, we covered 107 countries, representing close to 5.9 billion people. Of this, we have new estimates or updated estimates for 25 countries, representing more than 900 million people. At the global level, the surveys covered in the global MPI represent some 78% of the world population. Now, the measure itself focuses on the developing regions, and here the coverage is about 90%. The highest coverage is in Sub-Saharan Africa, followed by South Asia, and the lowest coverage is in Europe and Central Asia. You may ask us why um, for the, we do not have 100% coverage for the developing region. And uh, the answer for this is because it's not yet possible because we lack multi-topic household surveys in a number of countries within the developing regions. Or if the survey is available, these are not open access um, for us to be able to make use of them. The global MPI primarily draws individual or household level data from um, two major sources. First, the demographic health surveys, widely known as DHS. And second, the multiple indicator cluster surveys, widely known as NICS. They've also incorporated surveys from PACFAM and national surveys. Depending on the countries, the surveys were fielded from 2008 to 2019. Now, there may be some concern that a few of these surveys are too old, but I would like to assure you that 83 of these surveys, representing 90% of the population that we cover in the global MPI, and home to 92% of the MPI poor were fielded in the recent five years. No surveys are perfect. There are always data constraints. Um, normative and technical decisions may have to be implemented to manage these data constraints. For example, in a couple of surveys, um, certain indicators may have not been collected. In six, in six countries, there is information on nutrition but the surveys lack information on child mortality. In another 10 surveys, the survey has data on child mortality, but it lacks information on nutrition. So what does this mean? Um, both child mortality and nutrition are the two indicators that make up the health dimension. As such, we have continued to use this surveys by assigning one third of the dimensional weight to the one existing health indicator. The global MPI estimation also requires full information for each observation. In this case, observations or individuals uh, that have missing values in any of the 10 indicators that are considered in the global MPI will be dropped from the sample. Bias analysis is then conducted uh, to establish whether the estimation are biased due to the sample drop. And in cases where uh, the estimation is biased, then the survey is excluded from our work. In addition, surveys are usually updated every three to five years, and these are in different years. Um, one of the concern and one of the need has always been also to have more recent, more updated surveys. However, we need to acknowledge that uh, the data quality has greatly improved over time. In 2010, 60% of the countries that were included in the Global MPI had all 10 indicators. In 2020, this is 80, the coverage is 80%. Every methodological and technical decision related to each country survey is carefully documented and extensively documented in the Global MPI uh, methodological notes. And these are available on our website. So what does the Global MPI 2020 estimates show us? We find that 1.3 billion people are living in acute multidimensional poverty. So this means 22% of the population living in the developing regions of the world are MPI poor. Now, the unique thing about the global MPI is also that um, it can be broken down to subgroups and places. So it makes it uh, very meaningful for policy purposes. For example, we find that almost half of the MPI poor are children under the age of 18 years. In addition, some 84% wake up in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Two-thirds of the MPI poor live in middle-income countries and over 84% live in rural areas. 
In addition, we also find that the 1.3 billion MPI poor are deprived in a critical mass number of indicators. Over 1 billion are deprived in cooking fuel, housing and in sanitation. I would like to bring a closer attention to the global MPI statistics. And this statistics is relevant for all 107 countries. But let's zoom into Bangladesh as an example. It's one of the surveys that we updated in this round. We find that close to 25% of um, the population living in Bangladesh are MPI poor. And this translates to 40 million people. And among the MPI poor, we find that they are deprived on average in 42% of the weighted indicators. Now, what do we mean by intensity among the poor? So we find that among the 40 million poor in Bangladesh, just under two thirds of them are deprived in greater than 33.3%, but less than 40% of the weighted indicators. While 2% of the MPI poor are deprived in 90 to 100% of the weighted indicators. So a person who is deprived in 90% of the weighted indicators has a greater intensity of deprivation than someone deprived in 40% of the weighted indicators. Now, countries may have very similar uh, levels of incidence of poverty. The age may be the same, but the pattern of intensity may differ. For countries that have a higher level of intensity, this will be reflected in their MPI value which means the MPI value will be higher. We can further disaggregate the statistics to the subnational level. For example, in Bangladesh, four of the seven regions have higher MPI value than what we have observed for the national level in the earlier table. Now, this is very informative for policy purposes because government will know which are the subnational regions that would require urgent attention. The Alkaya Foster method has a property that makes the global MPI even more useful. It's called the dimensional breakdown. So we can understand the proportion of uh, the population who are MPI poor and at the same time deprived in each indicator. So in Bangladesh, we find that a high proportion of the MPI poor are deprived in cooking fuel and housing, followed by years of schooling. But do recall that um, the health and education indicators reserve more weight than indicators related to living standards. So we may find that even if a higher proportion of MPI poor are deprived in living standard indicators, the contribution of these indicators to overall poverty may be low. And this is the case in Bangladesh, where we find that the years of schooling indicator have higher contribution to overall MPI then cooking fuel or housing, even if the latter two has a higher proportion of MPI poor who are deprived in this set of indicators. Now, when we further disaggregate this information by rural and urban areas, we find a difference there. We find that in rural areas, living standard indicators contribute more to MPI, while in urban areas, it is the years of schooling that dominates. So how is this information helpful? This could mean different policy responses in different areas um, by the government. So this makes the MPI very useful for monitoring the effects of policy shifts and program changes that are being implemented. And um, for the next couple of slides, Sabina will be leading uh, the discussion. Thanks so much to Usha and to all of you for being here. I'm Sabina al -Khair. Sorry, I cannot be there um, in person today. So. I'm going to first talk about the trends in the global MPI and later about the 10 years anniversary. So this year, for the first time, we have trends for a critical mass of countries, 75 countries home to 5 billion people. And the headline is that of those 75 countries, 65 reduced MPI statistically significantly. And those 65 countries are home to 96% of the population living in the 75 countries. So it's a strong finding. And 
the fastest reduction in poverty was among three African countries, Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Liberia. And they had different starting levels of poverty from around 60 to around 82 percent. Um, and they had the reduction was in between four and six years. And as you see, how they reduced poverty differed. Because remember that there's only one way to reduce multidimensional poverty, which is that you reduce any deprivation of any poor person. And then either intensity or incidence of MPI will go down, and MPI will go down with 100% certainty, insofar as you can with the repeated cross-section data and the sampling errors. But what you see is that the red bar for Sierra Leone on the left was stronger, for example, in reductions of nutrition or cooking fuel, sanitation and electricity than others. But the orange, Mauritania, was, had a strong reduction in deprivations of years of schooling. And Liberia had better reduction in terms of putting children into school, reducing deprivations in assets. So the patterns differ, although these three reduce multidimensional poverty the fastest in absolute terms. Absolute terms is sort of comparing like with like the number of deprivations and people. But we might also think of a relative measure of change. And a relative measure of change says, what is the distance that we have gone between our current level of poverty and zero? And so a country like North Macedonia, which has very low levels of poverty, could not be the fastest in absolute terms. It doesn't have enough poverty redu to reduce. But we find that North Macedonia, China, Armenia had the fastest reduction in relative terms of all of, of the countries. And in terms of the number of people leaving poverty, of course, that depends on the time between the two surveys. But in India, over 270 million people left multidimensional poverty in 10 years. Um, in China, it was 70 million in four years. In Indonesia, um, Bangladesh, there were also very strong reductions in the number of people in a five-year period. So what the overall trends show is that by different measures of change, that we are able to find different patterns of poverty reduction. So let's look at that just a little bit more. First of all, this graph has all of the countries um, in ranked in terms of the speed of absolute reduction on the left-hand side with the red bars and relative reduction on the right-hand side with the blue bars. And it tends to be the middle or high-level countries that had the fastest reduction um, in absolute terms, though their levels of poverty vary um, somewhat. And the less poor countries might have had stronger relative reductions. Let's now look at one case study. And we have on the OFI website, as Usha may have mentioned, um, a country briefing for the global MPI that Usha presented. But we also have for each of these 75 countries a country briefing for uh, the trends in time. And so if your country, for example, of your field work or your studies is included, then you can have all of the details that I'll present for Bangladesh for each of the 75 countries. So in Bangladesh, we have data from 2014 to 2019, demographic and health survey data. And in those five years, MPI fell by more than a third from 0.175 to 0.101. And the incidence of MPI, the headcount ratio or poverty rate, fell by over a third from 37.6% to 24.1%. And you see that there was an intensity decline as well, and that all three changes were statistically significant at the 99% level. In terms of relative change, MPI was reduced each year 
at 10% of the distance to zero um, in the compound relative or constant relative change. So each of those numbers uh, gives an optic on how Bangladesh, for example, reduced poverty. And the MPIT indicates that when we talk about changes in MPI, then we are comparing like with like. So the numbers may be a little bit different from the global MPI that are in the other tables because they've been strictly harmonized. So the definition of nutrition is the same in both years. The composition of assets is the same. And so if one survey maybe didn't include men in its nutrition data, or if maybe in assets it's missing animal cart, then both years will drop animal cart so that, so that they are strictly comparable. And the MPIT indicates that for these 75 countries to do this trend analysis, there's been a strict harmonization of every single indicator. And again, if you're interested online, there's a methodological note for how we do changes over time. And for each country in the appendix, there's a paragraph showing exactly what was changed in the indicator definitions to make them strictly comparable. Then how did poverty fall? Bangladesh was one of the 20 countries in which each indicator was reduced statistically significantly. Um, and you can see that nutrition, the far left-hand red bar, reduced strongly, as did years of schooling, as did electricity, particularly, and then housing and cooking fuel and sanitation, similar levels of reduction. These are of the censored headcount ratios. These are reductions in the deprivations of people who are identified as poor and are deprived in this indicator, and they are annualized. In the bottom, you'll also see the headcount ratio of that indicator, censored headcount ratio, in the first year. So for example, if you look at the dark red of child mortality, you'll see it says 2.3%. And what that means is that in 2014, 2.3% 2 of the population were deprived in child nutrition. So that you might think it doesn't look like it changed very much, but the initial deprivations were very low. The other thing to describe is that the countries periods between their surveys vary from three years to 12 years. And so we present annualized reductions. You'll see that on the left-hand axis. And so what that is showing is what percentage of people reduced their deprivations in that indicator each year. And that means you can compare Bangladesh with a five-year period to India with a 10-year period, and you'll be comparing the annual reduction of each. Then we look at um, if we are leaving anyone behind. And so in this graphic, a bubble chart, the horizontal axis shows the level of poverty and the poorest group, which is children under the age of 10, are the poorest. And the vertical level is the speed and you're trying to reduce to zero poverty. So the ones at the bottom are reducing the fastest. So this is a pro-poor trend with the poorest group, children under 10, reducing poverty the fastest. Happily, children reduced poverty faster than adults and statistically significantly in every country of South Asia. But sadly, across the 75 countries, in 13 countries, children had no statistically significant reduction of poverty. And in 11 countries, children reduced poverty, but faster, slower than adults. Children were being left behind. And so in nearly one third of our countries, 24 countries, children are reducing poverty either not at all or slower than adults. So it's a group we really have to continue to look out for. Then we can also look at subnational regions. So um, on the left panel, we see the reduction by the same axis, as I described before for children, of the subnational regions of Bangladesh. 
and we see Silhat, which is the poorest, reduced poverty the fastest. And we also see in the right-hand panel that that's a change, because in the decade from 2004 to 2014, Silhat was not fastest. It was poorest, but it was not the fastest reduction. So that's something to celebrate. Across the 625 regions that we cover in this year's changes over time, 398 regions, home to about three quarters of the population, had statistically significant reductions in, uh, in MPI. And 45 of them reduced poverty in every indicator. If we look across regions, um, the left hand is purple, the next one is South Asia. And driven by the incredible reduction of India, which cut its MPI by half, one of four countries to do so, and got 273 million people out of poverty um, in a 10-year period, we see that South Asia overall had the largest annualized reduction in MPI. And Sub-Saharan Africa had the next biggest. These are the two poorest regions, but it's still salutary that they are making strong progress. But what do we know going forward? So um, Ricardo Nogales, Natalie Quinn, Nicolai Sapa um, also did two interesting pieces of analysis in terms of, first of all, how many of these 75 countries, if the present trends continue, would be on track to cut the global MPI by half between 2015 and 2030. That's the SDG period. The SDG goal is for national MPIs, but it's an interesting exercise. And they use both the linear trend, the constant relative trend, and a logistic model. And for 47 countries, no matter which model we use, they are on track to cut their MPI by half if present trends continue. 10 countries, the models gave different answers, but in 18 countries, 14 of which are in sub-Saharan Africa, um, they were off track and they could not, at present trend, cut their MPI by half. But all of these data were collected before COVID. So our next task was to say, how did the pandemic impact the global trends. And to do so, we made six scenarios. The World Food Programme, using data from 55 countries, 56% of population in those countries, and 49 of those countries matching our countries, identified a probable rise by 130 million people who would fall into food insecurity. And UNESCO looked at the data of children out of school and in April 2020, this peaked with 91% of children being out of school. We then mapped these scenarios in, in this way. For the food insecure, we mapped it onto undernutrition. And we did so saying that if any household did not have uh, a person who was undernourished, but that household was either MPI poor or vulnerable, deprived in 20% or more of the indicators weighted indicators. Then we identified 10, 25, or 50% of them as being newly undernourished from the pandemic. And across the entire distribution, we anticipated that half of school-aged children might not be in school or might not return to school. When we implemented this across the 70 countries, for which we have nutrition data, we found that the MPI reductions that we had shown were set back at least three years, but up to 10 years. At least 131 million people fell into poverty, um, but poverty numbers from COVID could have risen to 547 million. Now, this is not a diagnosis, it's a scenario, and we do the scenario in order to incentivize so we often cite the case of Sierra Leone. I mentioned in the first slide, Sierra Leone had the fastest reduction of MPI across any of the 70 
countries. And that occurred from 2013 to 2017. But from December 2013 to March 2016, the Ebola pandemic raged within Sierra Leone. And uh, the pandemic required um, responses at a galloping speed. And from talking with Sierra, people within Sierra Leone, we know that human error and tragedy also occurred in that period. And yet, Sierra Leone reduced MPI from 74% to 58% of the people. And the MPI value was the highest. The reduction, absolute reduction of children was the highest. It reduced it in all indicators and in 12 of its 14 subnational regions. So now during a pandemic, the question is whether we can marshal the political will, the intelligence and the creativity to also make the pandemic with its potential tragic impact a moment where we turn a corner and make an inflection point historically on the kind of acute multidimensional poverty the global MPI represents. 2020 is the 10 year anniversary since we launched the global MPI in 2010 at the 20 year anniversary of the human development reports. And Mariana Santos, the co-author of that original paper, um, in, put together this slide um, and, and, and presentations. So I just wanted to acknowledge with gratitude the community of people um, who have passed through OFI, through this department, and people who have never come to the department but have worked with us from their countries um, in bringing together a body of analysis that has qualitative and quantitative insights, graphics, design, communication packages. So for example, in 2010, the news story that carried the headlines was that there are more MPI poor people in the eight poorest states of India than in the 26 poorest African countries combined. And we developed that headline because at that time, there was a perception that poverty was all African. And if you look at the $1.90 a day or then the $1.25 a day figures, monetary poverty was clearly demonstrably um, dis distributed differently than what we found when we analyzed acute multidimensional poverty for the same time. Here's some other headlines. In 2011, we went with that over two thirds in that year, 72%. But in every year, it's been at least two thirds of the MPI poor people live in middle income countries. In 2012, there was no human development report, but we analyzed 39 countries that were least developed countries and found that whether you ranked countries in terms of MPI, H or A, the 20, 22 or 25 poorest countries were all least developed countries. So we did really need to focus on these. In 2013, we observed that the level of MPI and $1.25 differed quite a bit. And the trends did for the 12 countries we could analyze that year. By 2014, we had trends for 34 countries and two and a half billion people. And this was led by Nepal in the period from 2006, their peace agreement to 2011. In 2015, we celebrated that after much discussion with many countries and NGOs, the SDGs recognized as their first goal, the reduction and ending of poverty in all its forms and dimensions. And that the first target was about ending $1.90 a day monetary poverty, but the second of 169 targets focused on reducing poverty in all its forms and dimensions. In 2016, we looked at people who were destitute. They experienced severe hunger, or their toilet was open defecation, or nobody in their household had completed more than one year of schooling. And we found that that very sad measure of poverty that we hoped would hardly touch anyone because the MPI was already very acute, but we found that one half of the MPI poor people were destitute. We also, by the way, have launched MPI in different countries. 
And in 2016, we launched it in Côte d'Ivoire. In 2011, it was Nepal and so on. In 2017, thanks to fantastic work by Anna Vaj and others on the team, um, we went with the headline for the first time that nearly half of the MPI poor people were children. And since that date, we have always age disaggregated global MPI. In 2018, when the global MPI was revised significantly, as Usha said, to align with the SDGs, the headline was that 271 million people moved out of poverty in India in a decade, a headline equivalent to the numbers moving out of poverty in China during the peak of their reduction of monetary poverty. This showed that it was a momentous change of global importance. In 2019, illuminating inequalities, we observed um, subnational inequalities. For example, if you just look at low income countries, the levels of MPI go from 0.2% to 99.4%. If you look at lower middle income countries, it's from zero to 87%. And so we need to disaggregate. And across this um, 75 billion people, 75 countries, as you saw, we went with the reduction of uh, countries. 65 countries. So I want to thank everybody who has been part of the global MPI team and their names didn't fit onto one slide. But each year, somebody oversees the preparation of the data sets, a very precise, tedious, behind the scenes, vital task. Mariema Santos, followed by Jose Manuel Roche, Adriana Conconi, Gisela Rodríguez Aguilar, and Usha Kanagaratnam have been our leaders of the data preparation, estimation, and analysis of the global MPI, alongside each year a team of others. And our methodological note um, sings their praises, very rightly so. And then there have been many methodological innovations, and the pictures didn't fit. A PowerPoint gave me design suggestions, which dropped off a number of faces. But clearly, our bag of tricks has increased. Uh, we had qualitative ground reality checks. We do robustness tests, standard errors, disaggregation, different poverty cutoffs, the destitution measure, the bottom billion inequality among the poor, child poverty, new things we'll release next year on intra-household and gendered poverty, and a global toolbox. And I'd like to really signal Nikolai Sapa in the upper right-hand corner, who with Usha Kanagaratnam has just put the global MPI on different footing in terms of the Stata programming that underlies it. And um, I do encourage you, if you're interested, if you're on the MSC or doing your DPhil in economics, to, to think of, of exploring that. Uh, it's also been recognized by Stata Journal as, as an innovation that Nikolai and Usha have. And also the changes over time work that we signaled has been a long, very detailed and steady process with different people focusing on countries of India and China um, and on different groups of, of analyses through the years. And this year, um, Corinne Mitchell, Fanny Covesti, Sophie Charlene Petty, and Monica Pinilla Roncancio led um, the changes that I discussed. So thank you very much for this seminar. The resources are all online, whether you would like a do file or whether you would like an interactive data bank to maybe cut and paste an image or a chart for a presentation you'll make on your own country of interest, whether you would like a country briefing or you'd like data tables to be able to compare within a region. All that we have is in the public domain. And I think I speak for the whole team when I say we welcome input and we welcome uh, engagement with the community at QEH and beyond, um, who will continue to talk about these themes throughout the seminar series. Thank you. So thank you very much to Wush and Sabina, who in spite of not being with us here live today um, to present, to make the presentation, they have put together an excellent 
uh, insight about the journey of the Google MPI. And we do have some interesting questions and uh, however, we do have little time. So uh, perhaps Usha, I will try to ask you some questions and you can perhaps discuss them um, with the audience. So the first one, uh, thank you very much Samira for the question is basically whether uh, it is important to identify poor households or perhaps to identify special clusters of poverty. Um. So in any poverty uh, analysis or poverty measure, people are always the center of the analysis. And I think the first step is always to identify who is poor at an individual level. Now for policy purposes, there may be interest to aggregate your, the figures that we have individual level conditions uh, to certain region or certain subgroups. But the individual level uh, focus allows policymakers to detect any sort of heterogeneity within clusters without assuming a priori that you know, people are homogeneous within those clusters. So I would say, yes, uh, the center of the analysis is individuals. Thank you very much, Usha. Uh, there's also another very interesting question from Gertrude, and it relates about the inclusion of income in the MPI measure. So basically, yes. why, would we, why would we exclude income? Yes, um, so the lack of income and why? Well, the global NPI, it's a global measure. It has to represent um, you know, um, a certain set of countries um, that has a global representation. So which means we work with 100 plus country surveys. And as I discussed earlier, um, the majority of the surveys that we use are the DHS and mixed surveys. Now, monetary data are not collected as part of these surveys. And why? That's because they collect very detailed health related indicators which are equally time consuming and also takes up a lot of uh, expenses. Um, so we are limited in terms of, uh, we are not able to include this as one of the indicators or one of the dimensions, simply because we do not have uh, the data that is needed to construct an internationally comparable uh, deprivation set of indicators. Now the same argument also applies for the uh, last question, which is, uh, the disability related question. Yes, we are very much interested. We would like to include it as one of the indicators or perhaps even think of disaggregating it. But uh, for at this stage, um, you know, uh, only 18 countries within the pool of the DHS and mix have uh, questions related to disability that are actually comparable. Thank you very much, Usha. And uh, also something that is very related to ongoing work. It's a question related uh, that asked by Sadia, and it relates to uh, the MPI and its ability to detect rural and urban differences. So perhaps you can explain how the MPI actually captures or uh, perhaps some limitations when it captures urban and rural differences. Well, um, we have 10 indicators and I think um, you know um, everyone who's present today online would agree that regardless whether you're living in urban area or in rural area, uh, clean drinking water, safe drinking water matters. Um, you know, um, improved sanitation matters. Um, and uh, having at least one small asset that would keep you informed and you know, um, of uh, what's current happenings um, is equally important. Um, having certain minimum years of schooling is important. So this is regardless where you're living, whether it's urban or rural. Now, we do admit that probably when you're looking very closely to the assets uh, indicator, the, the certain type of assets uh, that are within the global MPI uh, may look like it's favoring certain um, area of the country. But in 2018, when we were actually uh, trying to, uh, when we were revising uh, or looking at the possible indicators that could, could be included in the revision of the global MPI, there was this uh, a huge set of um, you know, asset related indicators example that we explored. This includes uh, land and livestock variables. But what happened is we found that uh, the response structure to these questions were differed between country and the information were too diverse across the surveys that could actually uh, permit for the development of a comparable indicator. And this has been very neatly uh, documented in uh, Frank Walmer and Sabina Alkaya's uh, 2018 paper. I think um, if Frank is uh, online here, he's probably one of the best person to discuss um, uh, the kind of limitations that you actually face um, in sort of bringing in indicators that are representative of the rural and urban, particularly for assets uh, within the context of a uh, global measure. But my argument stands that uh, there are limitations, 
But I think when you look closely at across these 10 indicators, the large majority are representative for me as an individual, regardless where I'm living, whether it's rural or urban or the northern part of the uh, you know, uh, country or the southern part of the country. Thank you very much, Usha. And maybe just taking us, those are very precise responses to very precise questions. And I'll taking a little bit of a, of a step back and thinking about how actually the MPI informs policymakers. There's a very interesting question posted by Sana, who asks, how does the MPI allow us to help alleviate poverty? That's a very broad question, but perhaps it would be interesting to hear insights. So I'll probably give uh, a brief uh, in, you know, feedback from the global perspective. Um, but I would encourage my colleagues, uh, you know, um, Ricardo or um, uh, Monica, who um, leads the work at the national level to also jump in for this, because uh, there's been a great amount and significant work that is being done at uh, the national uh, different countries um, where uh, the impact has been probably much more clearer. So in terms of the global MPI, I think the first um, need that we knew uh, in the last three years was that we need to understand how multidimensional poverty has changed over time. Now that is important because uh, only when you have those, uh, when you have harmonized uh, those numbers and when you look at how much a progress um, they have made, that you can actually understand which country is actually not in track to meet the 2030 development agenda or which country has, you know, sort of uh, progressed so fast. Um, and where is it, which indicator that has helped them to move uh, you know, uh, forward? What are the policies that actually worked in this country? And I think, as I highlighted earlier, one of the um, highlight components within the global MPI is the dimensional breakdown, which is you know, uh, part of the uh, Fire Foster method. And this particular um, you know, uh, uh, method is important because um, it informs policymakers where the problem lies, or if it's a positive progress, um, why the achievement, why we have achieved uh, positively. So I think MPI is, global MPI is a powerful tool because you're looking at um, not one, two countries, but 100 plus countries. And so there are many lessons that can be learned at a certain aggregate level. So thank you very much, Usha. I guess that uh, that brings us a little bit to the end, but perhaps I would just add to what Usha said when it comes to using the MPI as a tool for reducing poverty, that of course the Google MPI that has been the object of this presentation aims at being an internationally comparable measure. But then there are other MPIs that are, have a different structure and have different purposes and that are developed not by OP itself, but by National Institutes of Statistics as permanent and uh, official measures of multinational poverty in their countries and in their context. So uh, poverty, of course, can actually be, uh, be guided by those kind of, of, uh, of indicators alongside you know, how they situate themselves within the global context and within the region. So um, the MPI itself uh, is a lens, it's a tool, but at the end of the day, it has to be useful for policymakers and uh, the, the better knowledge and the better information that they gather and they offer for the policymakers, the better. So uh, just to uh, close, first of all, um, I would like to thank Usha and Sabina once again, and I would like to thank all of you for your participations. Uh, as we mentioned, this is going to this is being recorded and it's going to be available in our platforms uh, later on. And uh, if we don't have the time to cover all the questions because of time limitations, we do apologize in advance. But we do invite you to have this conversation on a regular basis. So this is all the time we have for now. But uh, please, let's keep the conversation going. Let's keep uh, the interaction um, uh, coming together. And uh, we can do that uh, by visiting our website. We can do that by exchanging emails. But I do invite you to join us for the next seminar, which is going to take place uh, next Friday at the same time. And we're going to have uh, Dr. Ebele Madweque from the Technical University of Munich uh, presenting a work uh, which is also related to the Akaran Foster method, but from a slightly different perspective. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Usha. Thank you to all the participants for, you, for joining us. And please uh, uh, join us next week as well. Thank you very much. And everybody have a good day and have a good afternoon.